Hello and welcome to All Indians Matter. I am Ashraf Engineer. If the world and India face a climate change crisis, we must understand that it is also a justice crisis. Now, what do I mean by that? Across India, in the name of development, the government refuses to listen to communities most affected by climate impacts or who saw the danger of climate change long before anyone else did. These include tribals who are being driven out of their forest homes for mining projects, rural populations who have seen their farm yields dwindle alongside an increasing occurrence of pests, and riverine populations who have seen their rivers change color and die due to industrial pollution. We won't solve the climate problem without understanding the justice problem. While we work on lowering emissions and greening our land, we must at the same time address the injustice of poverty, exclusion and inequality. All Indians Matter We have on the show Camilia Biswas, a senior doctoral fellow at the Humanities and Social Science Discipline of IIT Gandhinagar. She works on the political ecology of climate disaster in the Indian Sundarbans and how it reconstructs the human-tiger-mangrove relationship from a participatory GIS approach. Her work takes her to the remote forest fringe villages of the Sundarbans such as Samser Nagar and Kumir Mari. Kamilia's work proposes a decolonial mixed methodology with GIS and remote sensing to plan the sustainable management of the Sundarbans landscape by integrating and collaborating with local and marginal communities. She is an INLAX RS Conservation Grant awardee and has been one of the 100 fellows from South India for the British Council's Women Leadership Project. She is also a junior fellow with the Global Research Network, a UK-based think tank. Camelia has been publishing articles in the popular media and journals about issues related to the locals of the Sundarbans and the climate. Welcome, Camelia. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Camelia, climate justice is a little understood term. Explain it for our listeners. So to understand climate justice, the underlying injustice has to be put on spotlight, especially how climate change has adverse social, economic, public health and other impact on underprivileged population. So climate justice per se came into public limelight because of the rise of several grassroots movements like, you know, you might have heard about Fridays for Future or school strikes for climate. And recently, uh, you know, the global attention that uh, the famous Greta Thunberg has brought up to. So when comprehending climate justice, we have to know that social justice is entwined in the whole conversation. It is about recognizing the historical responsibility of the crisis and those who are most affected are the ones least responsible for it. And for a long time, climate change effect, for example, you know, global warming was primarily understood as an environmental concern. Now, we have to acknowledge it as a human crisis. So, you know, when we are thinking about recognizing the solution to a climate crisis, it is not just a scientific matter, but a political one, a social one. So it is just much more than data and statistics, you know, carbon emission degrees and warming. It is also about understanding the concepts such as who has the power, who has the access to this data, who has the access to the resources and who is getting justice and who is not getting justice. Yes. I think that's a critical point, Camilla. And one of the consequences and drivers of economic progress is unsustainable consumption. How does the never-ending consumption appetite of the affluent impact those who are not so lucky? Yes, if you think about the global North's economy, you know, America, United Kingdom, and all the whole Europe, they have built on this colonial economic model, which has led to massive destruction of wealth from countries like Africa, South America, and Asia. And in our new colonial era, that is like the extended colonial version that we are living in right now, its economic system is sort of designed to concentrate on power, which is in the hands of few. And they're maximizing profits for the wealth. And they're driving this global inequality. So the gap between rich and poor is widening each passing day. And moreover, this today's extractive economic model is replicated through powerful companies, you know, like if you can, everybody knows like Amazon, Apple in India, Reliance Industry, Ambani Industries, um, Adani and the global supply chain that operates across the globe. They are extremely irresponsible because, you know, for having local communities and local environment being constantly exploited. It is the marginal and vulnerable communities across global south who has to bear the brunt of this effect of industrialization, which has led to climate change and further, which has led to this layered injustice. 
and the most iconic example i will give here is the narmada dam project and the subsequent you know narmada bachao andolan movement which has accounted to million of marginal communities including thousands of adivasis being displaced from their land so the environmental impact of these several and similar economic projects whether dams or building highways have resulted either in the displacement of marginal community from their traditional land or has dramatically destroyed the ecosystem change which has reduced or eliminated subsistence livelihood that these people were dependent on and what i mean is that you know they are sort of decreasing reliance and resilience on this traditional source of food uh, that is related to increasing prevalent of food related disease such as malnutrition or it can also lead to even you know diabetes so compulsory displacement typically has negative effects on health outcome in tribal communities specifically vulnerable populations such as children and elderly so in all in all the one who displaces doesn't even get the benefit of you know electricity and and good food and all these things in fact camilla you're absolutely spot on the people who get displaced actually never see the fruits of that so called development and that's been a consistent story in india you mentioned narmada that's just one example but we've seen so many we've seen what's happening in hasdevarand in central india we've seen what's happening in orissa in the name of mining but since you mentioned adivasis and tribals and indigenous people india is home to more than 705 ethnic groups which are clubbed under the umbrella of indigenous peoples and many others not officially recognized these are marginalized and vulnerable people and their largest concentration is found in the northeast of india and the tribal belt stretching from rajasthan to west bengal now this is an at risk group that lives by river beds forests sea shores and deep in the rural hinterland it is dangerously exposed to climate change could you explain how these particular groups are exposed to climate change so when we are talking about these communities they are extremely heterogeneous and they are socially disadvantaged in india specifically you know the adivasis uh, that is also known as scheduled tribes there are also scheduled caste or the dalits and the other backward caste and we often put them under this umbrella term of marginal community because the term marginal means the position of people living on the fringe areas these are the people who are either been forced off the land or are socially excluded in terms of caste and class and are often seen living in the most dangerous and vulnerable spaces with limited or no access to resources and their opportunities are often controlled by several state hegemonic forces so these people are living in, at the periphery at the margins and when climate change impacts hits like any sort of climate induced disaster whether flood or landslide let's say landslide or floods in assam cyclone in sundarbans or drought in rajasthan they are the first one to face them they are the front line communities they're constantly being pushed into vulnerable ecological spaces because they have nowhere else to go either voluntarily or involuntarily they have to live in that margin because the people in powerful position wants themselves to be safe first from climate change because they have all kind of privileges and access to and these communities don't right and does uh, climate change affect genders differently and if yes how so the climate crisis can never be gender neutral as far as i feel like and if we just discuss about cis genders first women and girls experience the greatest impact of climate change which amplifies existing gender inequalities and poses unique threats to their livelihood health and safety across the world women depends more on yet have less access to natural resources for example when any disaster or climate crisis sort of hits a family the women have to make sacrifices and various compromises like there's a limited food or aid post a cyclone the women will sacrifice her share of food for the rest of the family member yet she is the one who works the hardest to get the access to that food and other resources similarly after any disaster hits marginal communities struggle to meet ends and it is often the young girls who have to drop out of the school to help in family household chores and other activities and it also inevitably so called saves the school fees for sundarbans we saw a massive drop out of female students from middle and high school post the cyclone ila in 
also uh, if i would want to quote there's this famous feminist uh, human right defenders called as macha forin she's from thailand and she talks about this non binary genders like you know lgbtq plus a genders and she says that they are anyways invisible in everyday life and when it comes to climate change and its adverse effects their needs will never be thought of let alone addressed in a crisis situation and thus i feel when we are saying climate justice we are also having to address these structural changes this gender disparity and we need to advocate for and working towards the both equality and equity of all kinds in fact uh, you know that's a very telling point and in maharashtra where i hail from what we are seeing as uh, what known as climate brides where families which are badly affected by climate change marry off the girls early pull them out of school and uh, just because they cannot afford to take for care of them i think you touched upon that to some extent and uh, amelia one of the other consequences of economic growth is the unbelievable pressure on forests and tribals were pushed out of what has been their home for centuries to make pay for mines or highways at the same time they never see the fruits of this so called progress so could you detail that a little yeah in previous one or two question we sort of pull some of these examples right in front of us whether it's narmada bachao andolan the vedanta conflict with the niamgiri people in orissa and many more like this you know it's it's all around india and around the world as well so they are either displaced or devoid of access to forest resource when displaced we have to understand that the issue is far beyond just you know providing them with compensation and a resettlement site what about their occupation so a tribal community is often mainly dependent on forest resource and now uh, he or she or they are this place to a place or a region which they are completely unaware of the geography is different they can neither go back to the traditional livelihood nor they call this new displaced place as their own home and most of the time this tribal community is getting displaced for dam which you know is made to meant to produce electricity don't really have access to it and on the other you know when they are being displaced for making highways doesn't even have money to travel in a bus let alone have a car and travel on the highways so for the reason that they are been pushed to they actually can never or very hardly can see the fruits of this so called progress as you said i want to talk also about the sea level rise and its impact on coastal communities what are the impacts that you have observed in your work you know obviously i'm i'm working in sundarbans and it is an archipelago which is all around uh, you know mesh of rivers and seas and the most prominent observation of the sea level rise impact is the loss of shoreline that is there is excessive erosion of shoreline islands are getting inundated due to high tide every now and then it is leading to breaking of the embankments leading to salt water intrusion which further destroys the harvest and the fresh water fish catch in ponds all in all it is constantly disrupting the daily lives of the coastal communities um, for sundarban region you know it is the first in the world to record an unfolding climate refugee crisis as people had to flee from this island called loha chora which gets lost to the sea couple of years back almost a decade back and many islands in sundarbans are facing similar consequences and so are different islands in africa caribbean and asia they are shrinking and succumbing to the rising water and being collapsed this is leading to massive climate migration and making people climate refugees the government pays great lip service to sustainable development and its so called concern for the poor and the underprivileged but it doesn't actually do much for them what would be your message to the powers that be you know since the climate change and the climate crisis is also a human crisis it is entwined with political crisis as well so that means that its solution needs to take into account the messy and complex world of politics so climate justice as a concept recognizes that all the global warming is a global crisis its effects are not felt evenly around the world it is also a very local crisis which needs to be dealt in a very local or regional level Uh, so we are always talking about you know global and national agenda in sustainability and climate change i feel there is a need on focusing at a local and a very niche level because problem faced by these various heterogeneous marginal communities are not always the same they have different problems they have different demands and different approaches on addressing this 
problems and demands. So the government has to go from global to local, giving more agency and more access to these local marginalized communities. And Camilla, we've seen a series of extreme climate events in recent years, which has led to the collapse of cliff faces in the north, to extreme flooding in the south. We've seen some of that recently in Bangalore. How are these events linked to climate justice? I know you've touched upon them quite a bit before. Could you actually explain to, in layman's terms to the listeners how exactly this impacts uh, and what is the role of climate justice in this? So, you know, obviously by this time we have understood that what we have been calling as natural disaster, a climatic hazards, are not so natural. They are very much climate-induced. The frequency of such disasters have increased so as their pattern and onset. So, for example, more people are now getting exposed to this shallow, rapid moving landslides all over the world, whether it's the Himalayas in the northeast and the north of India. So, you know, there's this recent massive landslide that has happened in Manipur in June, where almost 30 people died. And there is also a similar landslide that has taken place in Gendrum village in Norway, Europe. So, you know, it is happening all over the world. But these catastrophic events have hard hitting on the marginal population of global south for a long term. And these injustices have been layering up in the name of development. You know, there is this massive construction of houses, dams, buildings, bridges to promote tourism is one of the reasons of these excessive landslides in the Himalayas. And who has to experience and grow through this continuous struggle are the ones who are the locals of those places, majorly belonging to the socially disadvantaged communities or the marginal communities. They lose their houses, their jobs, their land, their everything. Because the capitalist ventures on the Himalayas has only generated suffering, pain, displacement, loss and destruction leading to utter poverty in the name of development. Moreover, you know, this extreme heat that we have faced this year not only in India, but even Europe has faced, is making people sicker and poorer. And it could sharply diminish the living standard of millions of people in this region if the goals of mitigating climate change are not met uh, by these people in power. And Camilla, agriculture is the core of the climate problem for various reasons, food security, farmer incomes, dwindling soil quality, water use, etc. What are a few practical and immediate steps the government can take to make a difference? I feel it is important for the government to understand and address that our food habit and food consumption is one of the major contributing factors for the reason of food insecurity, dwindling soil quality and, you know, dwindling groundwater leading to low yield and production. Because there has been huge change in our food habit and consumption. And we have to understand that not every geographic region can produce every possible crop. So, for example, the extreme hot and extreme cold conditions region like Punjab, Haryana and Western UP are producing rice or paddy. And as we know that paddy requires flood irrigation, you know, this constant rainfall. And all these places, the annual rainfall is 600 to 700 mm, which is not enough uh, to, uh, you know, board this paddy. So they get highly dependent on groundwater for irrigation leading to massive decline in groundwater itself and not giving enough time to recharge it. So I feel to make a difference, traditional agriculture, alternative chemical uses, and lastly, an inclusive pay and health and other schemes for the farmers might help them battle the climate problem better possibly. And the government should take the example of, you know, uh, because you, you come from Maharashtra and I have this example in my mind is Hebre Bazaar. It's a village in Maharashtra. And what they do is that, you know, they sort of decide their cropping pattern and the crop choice on the basis of the rainfall they have in that same year. So it is important to understand that several cropping patterns are unsustainable and it only grows to maximize profit and income, but in long term is doing injustice not just to the farmer, but to the vegetation. So we have to stick to the traditional agriculture, the traditional ecological knowledge of the farmers. Climate change mitigation also requires huge amounts of funding. How does a country like India manage that? I feel India's management to mitigate climate change has several, you know, sort of loopholes owing to the fact that the allocation to the climate change action plan under the MOEFCC, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change sort of reduced from rupees of 40 crores in the in 2020 to 21 budget to rupees 30 crores in the 21-22 budget. So, and moreover, the paving development plan to some of the multinational and multi-million companies like, you know, you know, 
guess the names like adani ambani and more is making the system more hackend and capitalist driven though there are several funding agencies you know we might have heard of names like green climate funds but i always feel that these mitigation plans are often made from the point of view of the people who are sitting in a very powerful position they are very exclusive and we need to decolonize this whole mitigation strategies and to do so is that i feel that we have to include the marginal and vulnerable communities who are at the forefront of the climate injustice and we have to understand that what they need we have to strategize in a much more inclusive way we have to include them in the strategies of managing climate change mitigation funds Camilla India has laws and constitutional provisions such as the fifth schedule and the sixth schedule recognizing indigenous peoples right to land and self governance yet the fight to establish ownership over these lands and waters is arduous and we see so much climate injustice on a large scale why is that and what's the way out so we all know that indigenous people are highly dependent on forest resources in terms of both subsistence and sustenance and the loss of forest cover continuous you know mining and mineral extraction development projects of dam roads industrial setup and commercialization of agriculture are some of the impending threats which leads to climate injustice and these activities are over exploiting every possible resources which was once traditional and ecologically maintained and kept in equilibrium by these indigenous communities through their traditional ecological knowledge and practices furthermore i feel indigenous people's ability to exercise governance and access to their lands and natural resources is being questioned and has been challenged and as a result of the low socio economic status and their ongoing struggle with this severe climate crisis event you know there this uh, link to having rights on their lands and water is also diminishing and the way out is that i feel that many climate justice activists and scholars have been mentioning that you know also that the state needs to pass laws to make sure that the companies based there or have exploited or affected them must pay for the harm they have done to the people and the environment this includes upholding the rights of indigenous people and communities to protect their forest water and natural resources moreover any fair justice process involves listening to those who have been wronged the same is true for climate justice which i feel which means giving those who have been most affected by the climate crisis by giving them the strong voice in climate policy negotiation for too long the interest of wealthy corporation you know the global north countries have been dominated this talk so i feel it is important to bring the voices of these people you know we have seven or five ethnic groups that you have mentioned so we need to bring more diverse representation and not only bring their voices but we have to also implement the strategies so camilla let me ask you a question about uh, yourself that puts the shoe on the other foot so to speak you've identified large industry as playing a major role in climate injustice and few would disagree what role can industry play in ensuring climate justice is there something they can do now given their track record and that they need to make good anything that they could do now to ensure climate justice i feel first they have to understand that you know they have inflicted a lot of injustice they have to first you know i think they need to reflect and they have to stop traumatizing and exploiting the communities in the name of development and you know i feel doing csrs and planting trees won't really help and in order to achieve climate justice industries must acknowledge their culpability for creating this crisis the damage they have inflicted on the communities to extract several natural resources and make huge benefits and profits from it and you have also damaged the environment as well so they also need to take steps to amend them for example you know by supporting marginal communities by acknowledging but also using the traditional knowledge and system of the communities for environmental assessment for sustainable ecosystem management they can always take their knowledge the traditional knowledge can also be taken and you know sort of um, juxtaposed with the scientific knowledge and they must include this local communities in every step of decision making and they must take it seriously and apart from that obviously there is this whole introduction of alternative green and sur- sustainable way of operation but also to keep in mind that you know we have to move towards the climate justice and acknowledge and our position in this whole climate change movement So Camilla tell us about your work. 
So, um, you know, I'm a PhD uh, researcher. My main research work is based on Indian Sundarbans and I've also done work in several other places in India. But right now I'm focusing on Sundarbans where I sort of try to understand the changing relationship of the locals of Sundarbans. And they're mainly these marginal communities. They are belonging from the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes and how their relationship is with the mangrove ecosystem and the Royal Bengal tiger and how their relationship is changing in the face of climate-induced disaster. That is how these three three species like humans and mangroves and Royal Bengal tiger are sort of interacting with each other and within themselves and how there are different uh, multifaceted disaster impact which is impacting the whole Sundarban landscape. That's fascinating, Camilia, which brings me to the question I ask all my guests at the end of the show. Why do you do this work? Yeah, I mean, this is something, you know, I feel that specifically working in Sundarbans or doing this work is very close to my heart. It is more of a responsibility to pursue work in Sundarbans owing to the fact that my native roots, my family belongs from Sundarbans. I am a Sundarban native. My family has been a part of this whole cauldron of climate injustice. I have seen my grandparents and my father suffer. And I feel maybe through my research, my work, and my writing, I can showcase this injustice to the larger world. And moreover, I feel this research work that I do, it is just not of mine alone. It is an extremely collaborative work with all the residents of you know, Samshirnagar and Kumirmari, where I mainly work. It is about the people of Sundarbans, and it is for them. And you know, also for people belonging from socially disadvantaged communities who are often left at the margins to fight their own battle with no much assistance from the people who have money and power. So I feel if I could write something about them, I might be able to bring some justice to this climate injustice. Thank you. Camilla, very few people make the link between climate change, sustainability and climate justice. If India has to progress equitably, we can no longer afford to ignore this link. Thank you for detailing how. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me in this show. And uh, if you want to sort of read more about my work, you can always go to Google Scholar and type my name, Camilla Biswas, and you can find me there, find my articles and read them and share with people and share about these in, uh, discrepancies and the climate injustice that is happening with the people in Sundarbans. Thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. Please visit allindiansmatter.in that's A-L-L-I-N-D-I-A-N-S-M-A-T-T-E-R.in for more columns and audio podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at Ashraf Engineer that's A-S-H-R-A-F-E-N-G-I-N-W-E-R and All Indians Count that's A-L-L-I-N-D-I-A-N-S-C-O-U-N-T Search for the All Indians Matter page on Facebook. On Instagram, the handle is All Indians Matter. Email me at editor at allindiansmatter.in Catch you again soon. <laughs>